Hey folks, Steve here with another World in Flames video. Uh, this is the second video in the series covering my World uh, in Flames uh, Fascist Tide scenario. It's really the title of the scenario. I think it's easier for folks to understand that I'm playing the European theater, the European War of War in Europe. Um, last video we did a bunch of introduction and organization and just how to get things set up so we can play the game uh, well. And uh, what I had sort of started doing was sorting out the Americans. In this video, we'll look to do some uh, some more setup and cover a few other topics along the way. Um, you can see I've got the force pools set up for each major power that's involved in the war in Europe. There are some red counters there for Japan. That is related to uh, some of the special rules for the scenario that represents the possibility of Japanese raiding. So there are certain named ships that I had to fish out of the uh, Japanese counter pile. Um, which uh, wasn't as hard as one might think, but, you know, I've got Eagle Eye on counter, so I was able to find what I needed pretty quickly. But you can see everything else is set up. Um, again, similar to what I showed in the last video for the Americans, we've got uh, future year uh, stacks up here, and then the general force pulls down on these uh, rows along the way. You can see uh, I've got the ally sort of over here. I've got the axis over here. The lighting's not as good on this part of the room, which is why I don't typically game over here, um, but it works for the force pulls, and from time to time I will be showing on camera where I'm going over here for, for the force pulls. Um, pretty pretty straightforward stuff. So, um, now, in terms of getting ready for a game, and, I, and, and this is important uh, to point out for folks, I know, because if you're new to World in Flames, you might not really realize um, how to get things set up, and, and what's the order, and how do you do it right, and everything else. So in the last video, we set up a lot of the administrative counters. That's just the basic tracking stuff that every game has. That stuff was easy. The next step was getting all the counters and getting them organized into the force pools. Again, um, we, we've taken care of that. Uh, I, I did most of it off camera, but if you watched the last video, I did the same thing I did for the Americans. Um, I did ask some questions around about those Pacific theater American ships that don't have any setup information. There, there's like two different interpretations, I guess, and and I'm going to tell you which one I'm going with. One interpretation is um, because they're not said to be set up anywhere, you put them into the force pool and those ships can be built, even though historically they would be over in the Pacific doing stuff. Um, the other interpretation, which is the interpretation I'm going to take, just so for so you know for your awareness, um, the other interpretation is well, the rules say that units with setup codes are set up in the areas that are the setup code. So, you know, it's like W, M, C, R, you know, these letters on the back of some of the ship counters that tell you where they go. There's a key in the campaign book where they go. Um, but I am basically having uh, ships that have a key but don't have setup. The, the campaign setup rules also say to set up units without those setup codes in the force pool. So that's how you got the first interpretation, right? Well, you just put them in the force pool to be built. I'm interpreting that, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm acknowledging what is maybe a gap in the wording and maybe a sentence should have been included that wasn't to say um, ships that have a setup code that are not in play or on a map that is not in play or ships that, that are not called out for setup are simply removed from the game. I, I think that is the easiest thing to do because then you don't have weird things where, you know, I'm building ships that are already built and on the other side of the world. Instead, they're, they're just out of the game. They're, they're over into the Pacific, and, and we all acknowledge it, and, and we're not going to cheat the system by allowing the Americans to bring the entire Pacific fleet through the Panama Canal to the European front because it would be a bit imbalanced saying we're going to have a Pacific war going on. So all those ships are, are simply going to be out of the game. I, I find that just to be the easiest solution and to maintain play balance. Um, the American production will be cut in half in this scenario, uh, and so it's not like I'm going to have a ton of build points that I could just be trying to build these these other ships, but as the force pool expands of buildable options in the later years and those big stacks of stuff, um, the Americans will have plenty to build if they want to build anything at that point in the future. So. I think it all works out fine, it all works out great. So, um, when, once you have your force pulls situated like this, you've got it all ready to go, you can actually now start to do setup. And setup on the map, and, and all the initial 
type stuff that needs to occur. A um, couple of things to point out. Um, there is an order to how you do setup. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get our setup sheet up here just so you can see. So these are set up sort of in the order that the the countries set up. Um, so so you might look at you know in some games it's like oh you just set up you know one side and then the other or you can both kind of do setup and and if you're playing with your buddies and you just want to say hey just set up your stuff you can do that but there is intended to be a a set order and that set order is the USA for this scenario then the USSR then Italy, then the Commonwealth, then France, and then as we go over to the other side of the sheet, that's the rest of the French setup, and then Germany is last. Uh, I mentioned it, I think, in the last video, but the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if you're setting up last, you're essentially setting up in reaction to uh, your opponent. So there's a little bit of a advantage to setting up after an opponent that you're likely going to be at war with, so there's that to keep in mind. It's kind of useful. Um, the other thing I'm going to point out is uh, at, at the initial setup, and some people kind of skip this step and just go right into things, but technically what you're supposed to do is set up your ships in port, and then once everybody has set up their units, you basically get a free, like everyone gets a naval move, um, and then shift down a box. And that probably doesn't mean anything to you when I say that, but I will explain it when we get to that point a little bit later on, just to know that you're supposed to set up your ships in a port. Um, they will go out to sea because it is assumed that, you know, we're, we're not starting from a big bang, you know, fresh start of the universe. It's, yeah, these other ships were out to sea doing patrolling or, you know, the gears of war were kind of spinning up. And so ships were out there, convoys were out there, and we'll get we'll be able to represent that in the setup um, as, as a part of the action. Um so yeah, uh, I'm going to put a cut here, and I'm going to transition to talk about one other special topic that is important for setup, so uh, I'll give it just a second. Okay, I have the rule book open, and I want to call out on page 14 of the print rule book, and then depending on what PDF you're looking at, it might be a different page. Uh, but it is 5.1 uh, that talks about trade agreements. Now, the reason why this is important for setup um, is that there is at game start an expectation that there are certain trade agreements already in place, right? The world existed before World War II. So what were the trade agreements in place at that time? And uh, some of them actually require some careful thought on how uh, you're going to set up that, that you could easily miss or screw up if you weren't reading this section. Now, um, I, I can realize for new players that seems kind of crazy, right? Like, you know, there, there should be probably some really nuanced setup guide to tell you this, but, but uh, for me, it kind of came out of reading the rule book, um, and, and I'm the kind of guy who can sit down every once in a while and kind of flip through a rule book from front to cover, front cover to back cover, and, and pull things out. So take a look at these trade agreements. Now, I, it's going to be really hard to show on camera in a coherent fashion. Um, so you can see uh, there are uh, trade agreements for different nations. They're kind of in italics here, so the headings are, don't jump out at you. So Germany and the USSR have a trade agreement. Um, for setup, there's not much to worry about. You just have to worry about that during production, and the scenario notes actually help you see what that is. But there are certain circumstances that allow... And that trade agreement over here, and there's a whole table for it for Germany and the USSR um, to degrade and eventually uh, go away. So something to be watching out for if you're a German and Russian player, you'll be wanting to take a look at that. We'll, we'll go through it in time. Uh, there is a note here about Greece that, at least at the start of the game, doesn't really matter. It says a neutral Greece will supply the allied major power that controls all the hexes of the Dodecanese Islands. One resource, um, the Dodecanese Islands start Italian controlled, so that is not in play. Uh, Hungary is going to supply Germany with its resource, except for the whole Hungary business, which we will cover in a future video. Um, but that is a, you know, just FYI, you know, that's a land uh, resource that's going to travel by land from Hungary to Germany. Uh, through neutral t territory or Austria, so um, no big deal there. But in the case of Greece, 
with the Dodecanese Islands, um, that's very, very possibly likely <laughs> going to require uh, a, a, a naval method of delivering that resource to, uh, say, the Commonwealth, we'll just say it's the Commonwealth, to make use of it, um, where there's a factory that can use it. Uh, and this gets a little bit into the production model of World in Flames. Essentially, how you should look at it is, uh, one resource needs to be taken to one factory to create a build point, which then is multiplied by a multiplier based on your country's gearing for war, and that's how you have build points to uh, build stuff. Now, um, for countries like Germany, most of the time your resources are going to be in the same geographic location as your factories. So you can see uh, those orange dots are resources, the smokestacks are factories. You can see there's a lot of resources here. There are factories. They can all get to each other via rail lines. They're all happy in Peachy Keen. Um, but countries like the Commonwealth, for instance, or the United States may be dealing with situations where resources need to get to factories, and the only way they're going to get there is via uh, convoy. So the, the convoy uh, counters that uh, we looked at in a previous video are used to transport resources and build points from one location to another, and in some cases can be used for uh, lend lease and that sort of thing. Um, here, with these trade agreements, uh, the, probably the most important one to be looking at when you're setting up the game for the first time is the Italy-USA one. So Italy and the U.S. are obviously uh, oceans apart, <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea apart. And so um, they have a trade deal where uh, the um, Italians are getting a build point. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. An Italian build point goes to the USA, but is getting three resources um, each turn. So, so you think that that's four things being exchanged, right? One build point to the United States from Italy, three resources from the U.S. to Italy. So, so again, total of four things traveling. Um, now, there are ways that that trade agreement goes away. Uh, if they become active, so when Italy joins the Axis and goes to war, the United States will stop the trade deal, uh, and there are some other things. Again, it, I'm just showing you the page. You'd have to, you know, I'm going to really zoom in for you to read the whole thing. Um, and you can see, while this agreement is in effect to avoid any penalty, the USA must have enough convoy points in the sea areas from the USA to a sea area adjacent uh, to the Western Mediterranean Sea area to transport the resources and build point. Similarly, Italy may have enough convoy points in the Western Med and the Italian coast sea areas to transport the resources and build point. If during production, uh, Italy has met the obligation and the U.S. has not, then, you know, there's some penalties here. But basically, like, you're, you're, you're very likely going to want to, uh, as the Italians set up the convoys, you know, maybe there's some crazy strategic reasons as to why you would not, but in, ter in game terms, what that really means is that the U.S. needs to ensure that it sets up convoys that are running from the United States through the sea zone noted here, uh, at least to here, and then from the Mediterranean side, uh, there will be um, Italian convoys that are going to, you know, be the links in the chain. Convoys are a little interesting because they act a little bit different from most other uh, naval units. They don't have to return a base at the end of a turn or shift down a box. They stay in the zero box of sea zones, which We'll talk about sea zones a little bit later. Uh, there's, I have a whole naval mechanics video if you want to watch that and learn more. Um, and basically, really, convoys are more like pipelines. So you're going to have different uh, sets of convoys connected all across the sea zone maps. And these are really, um, you know, they're the lifeblood of the Commonwealth, for instance, but they're transporting um, those goods, right? They're transporting the resources or build points or whatever. And if you knock out a convoy in a chain, and all of a sudden now there's a missing link in the chain, the recipient and, and the sender can't send their stuff anymore. And that's how you get into the strategic warfare piece of World in Flames, where uh, the German U-boats or Italian U-boats might be trying to sink the, the Commonwealth convoys to keep the Commonwealth from getting build points, because they can't get the resources to their factories. So 
that's a that's a big element of the game, right? The w world in flames has an operational element where you're moving units around and attacking and taking cities and looking out for supply. Um, but then there's the strategic warfare piece of the game, where yeah, there is strategic bombing. There are U-boat campaigns and, and battles at sea to control the sea zones um, for for all of those purposes you can imagine. Um, so it's all pretty interesting stuff. But that's an important thing as we look at setup. Now there are other uh, trade agreements here. There's stuff about Japan, which isn't relevant for this scenario. Netherlands, not really relevant here. Um, and there's a few others that that have land-based uh, trade. So, so if there's a trade agreement and those resources to factories or whatever, or the recipient and the sender can do that, you know, sending of resources by land, you don't need to worry about the convoys, right? Um, the only other one worth probably noting here is Venezuela. So Venezuela, uh, while Allied controlled or neutral, is going to give the Commonwealth half of its resources, and the U.S. its other half um, each turn. So that's going to be another one. So if, if we think about when we eventually do the Commonwealth setup, the Commonwealth is going to have convoys all over the place pulling in resources. They optionally can set up a chain from Venezuela to the, the UK, and then again, the United States is going to have a convoy line uh, that, that is going to be reaching out to Italy, and Italy in turn is going to set up convoys to match uh, that. And because it is for, uh, again, talking about the U.S. and Italian trade agreement, because it is four items, three resources and, and one build point, um, you need a convoy point for each item so in playing the classic game where we only have denominations of 5 or 10, we don't have 1, 2s, 3s, 4s, and so on, what we're basically going to need to do is make sure that in each of these C zones, we at least have a 5 counter in that C zone, a 5 counter in that C zone, a 5 counter you know, in this C zone, 5 counter in that C zone, blah, 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 right? You need to have the capacity, the throughput limit through every link in the chain. You can't have... You know, five, you know, four, four, I'm going to say fives and tens because that's all the counters that we are using right now with classic, uh, the classic game without expansions. But if it was like you needed eight and you only had five, or maybe you had, you know, ten, 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 but in one of the C zones you only had five because you lost some in a naval raid, um, you couldn't get all eight or ten or whatever through that link uh, through the chain, right? You would be limited to five because your smallest, weakest link in the chain is five. So again, I, I keep using the, the, the metaphor of a pipeline. Think about that pipeline. Um, think about it in terms of throughput. I guess a pipeline, due to the way liquid travels, that maybe is not the right metaphor for this. But, um, you know, maybe it's a sem an assembly line <laughs> and there are holes in the machinery, but if one of your holes is too small, um, you're, you're not going to get the big piece of machinery through the, through the conveyor belt, right? However you want to look at it, but think about it like that. They, they are chains in the system, um, and the disruption will be if you force convoys to go home or they're destroyed, then you have to work on getting them back out to sea in the missing, you know, in the sea zone that they're missing from, which could take time. Um, it's, it's a great thing when your convoy lines are all working cohesively and they're, they're matching their need, um, but once you have them starting to be disrupted, it can become really hard, a real challenge, to get things back in working order and to keep them that way. So that is an element of, of the game that the Commonwealth will be worried about, uh, the United States will be worried about to some degree, um, and, and so on, right? So as we look to do the setup for... Um, the first country, which is the United States, I, we need to think about those convoys and how we place them where we place them. And I thought it, would, it was important that I explain that piece of the puzzle for new players because if you, if you skipped over the trade agreements, part of the rules, you wouldn't know that it, there is actually a reason to set up a certain way um, and you don't want to miss uh, those important pieces here. So I'm going to put a cut here and then we'll start looking at the United States setup. Okay, so let's take a look at the setup charts and let's figure out how to do this, right? The USA is a great place to start. Um, I mean, it's it, it's first anyway, but because there's a somewhat limited number of things to set up anyway, um, I think that really helps um, folks understand how it works. So when you look at these setup charts, you're looking at the country, 
And then you're looking at each line is essentially a region or a location where they're going to go. And it might be a broad region, like this, you know, the very first line here says USA. So we could put it anywhere in the USA. We could put it in Seattle, we could put it in California, we could put it in Texas. Um, because this is a European scenario, we're probably going to put things on the East Coast, right? Um, it might tell you to put things in the construction pool. It might tell you to put them in certain ports. It might put, say to put them in particular minor countries. It might even say uh, particular uh, cities or towns or ports like Freetown for the Commonwealth. So you're just going to want to make sure you pay attention to that. And I've, and I've seen folks play Victory in the West and they, they, the, the smaller Invasion of France scenario and, and screw up the Moroccan and Senegalese units because they just think they should set up in Morocco and Senegal, which... In the normal game, if you were starting from 1939, they, they would, um, but that scenario was later than 1939, and, and the setup charts say for those units to set up in France itself, because all that moving the units, shipping them from Africa to Europe has already occurred. Um, now here's, we're just starting from 39, so everything should be pretty straightforward. So we look at the line, and then we start looking across. Now, again, one of the annoyances here with the set up of the columns. The column distinction is not here, it's way up here. So we're going to have to, you know, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> but you can see there's the, the whole section here for land units is empty. So no United States land units set up at all. There are not going to be any. And now it's not to say there's not some armed forces of the United States that exist in some capacity, even in 1939. It's just they're in such small numbers that they're, they're not going to be worth showing on the map as a counter, and they're not you know, capable of conducting combat in the massed corps and army, you know, units or divisions that we would see in the game. So we look uh, over, 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 and we see we get some setup here. Again, we're ignoring offensive points and everything to the right. So the only columns that really matter for the United States are they have some aircraft, and then they're going to have note one for ships, and that's so that they can say all these ships here. So... What we're going to need to do is look at our planes, and we'll look to start drawing. So if we look at the, whoops, sorry, I bumped the camera. If we look at this, it says there's one, two build time FTR. So we need to pull one of those. Now if I look over here at the actual fighters that I have, um, I have two build turn fighters. In fact, that's all I have. Uh, we looked at this in another uh, last video, rather, um, there's really two options. There's a better option and a less good option. So if I put them in my hand, I'm just going to shake them up. I'm not going to use a cup for this because there's only two counters. I'm not going to look and I'm going to pull. Which one did I pull? Well, I actually pulled the better one this time. So I got the uh, P-36A plane that has a four combat factor for air-to-air, -air, which is better than the other unit, which is only a three. So I'm going to put the one I didn't pull back in the force pull and we're gonna get this unit and we're gonna set it up and just to make it easy I'm gonna bring it over here bring the camera with me and we're gonna we're gonna set it up right so I'm gonna throw it in you know it doesn't really matter we'll, we'll throw it in here in the Washington space it doesn't really matter right now there's only so many places we can put it so we're gonna set it over here in America no big deal so now, what we're going to do is do that for the next type. So the next item in the chart is a Land Bomber 3, of which there is only one option. So here, one Land Bomber 3, it is a Bolo plane. This is the only three build time Land Bomber in the force pool right now for the United States. Um, it is the only one there. It doesn't have any other LND land bombers to pick. So this is just the one that we're going to pick. And we also get a three build time naval bomber. So there's two. I'm going to shake it up and pull. And I get a, a Hudson 3. And I'll put this plane back. And let's see. Okay, and that's it other than the naval unit. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to put these guys over on the east coast of the United States, and then we'll, we'll come back. 
Okay, so in terms of the naval setup, um, this is going to be pretty uniform for most other power systems in terms of what you're going to see. It says uh, Note 1 over here, said so Note 1, okay. These ships that are named ships that have counters, the Ranger, Texas, Quincy, uh, Cincinnati, Trenton, and then you have some notation here, two TRs, Trez, those are transports, so two transports, a sub, and 20 convoy points is what we have to set up. Now, um, I have those named ships uh, here in my hand. I haven't had them picked out from before. I'm also going to pick up another uh, counter that is from the next line down, which is the construction pool, which calls for the battleship Wyoming to be set up uh, in the construction pool. So I'm going to add that to my stack that I have in my hands. We're going to draw randomly from our sub uh, sub allotment. So there's three subs possible. Shaking up my hand, and we get... Uh, the uh, S26 sub, so we'll get to place that, and the subs will go back, and then we get the uh, get to pick two transports, so we'll put the big stack of transports here, and we'll pull two out, so we get these two. Most transports are going to be pretty similar, sometimes you'll see a variance in their armor value, uh, but for the most part they're going to be pretty similar. So, I'm going to grab these guys. I've already grabbed the convoys, and you'll see on map here in just a second. I'm going to pick up the camera and take it with me. You guys see what I'm doing. Okay. First things first, we're going to put the Wyoming in the construction pool. So, the Wyoming is partially built. Uh, so, we're just going to place it up here, and at some future point, the Americans can start uh, the work to finish the the Wyoming and I should show on the back of the counter there is a C notation so when you see that um, a ship with a C depending on your your setup whatever scenario you're playing it may differ but if you're playing from a 1939 scenario uh, C usually will be they're gonna be in the construction pool so there we go um, we've got our transports or two transports our sub and, and our set of ships, you know, a nice stack of naval units. Now the question is, where are we going to put them in the U.S.? Well, um, you can see I started setting up the convoys, and I'll explain in a moment. I, I'm just going to put them here in, I'm going to put them in Boston, just so that I have stack coherency here. So, so these ships, wherever you're going to put them, you have to keep in mind that there is a, a capacity. So minor ports, which are, which are the anchor symbols that are white, can only hold a certain number of ships, whereas uh, the dark blue major ports, so um, New Orleans is one. You can see there uh, most of the major cities on the east coast of the United States are treated as major ports since there's tons of ports there, can stack unlimited uh, naval units, I believe. I believe it's unlimited. So any, pretty much anywhere we could put that big stack of units. We could separate them uh, if we wanted to. For now, I'm just going to throw them in that stack. May maybe what I'd do, just to make it easy, I, I might separate the transports out a little bit um, so that we could pick stuff up and try to move it if we had to. But that's kind of future state stuff. So I've got the planes there, I've got transports there, and then up in Boston, we've put the e eastern United States fleet, and they're not really in danger of anything. The U.S. is not going to be at war for a while, so they're kind of fine to sit there. Um, but I did set up the convoys. Now, I, I could have just waited and, and said, um, I, I'm not going to bother uh, to set them up until everyone else is set up. But again, because of the trade agreement thing, I just want to make sure that I can set them up um, now, since it's it's the easiest time to do it. So, uh, just to show, right, I have, they start with 20. So we had 20 convoy points that we, we would need to be able to move. They would technically start in some port in the United States and then be moved out of there. Um, what I did is I started and said, okay, well, there's going to be one in the East Coast. There's going to be one in the North Atlantic Sea Zone. The North Atlantic connects to uh, the... See if I can get it on camera. The uh, Cape St. Vincent Sea Zone. You see, there's a, a line here that says goes to the North Atlantic. So this is adjacent to the North Atlantic, and we've put um, 
and, and you got to understand the North Atlantic's kind of a... Um, so we should be good from a convoy perspective. My camera goofed up a little bit. So tracing, uh, you know, here to here to here, uh, and then we'll set up the Italian convoys in, in the Mediterranean. But this is what the U.S. needs to do. I might double-check just to ensure. I'm, I'm pretty confident that Cape uh, St. Vincent is adjacent to the North Atlantic with those blue lines. I'm not sure that the, the big uh, red hex dot is an issue or not. I'll double-check that. Um, but we'll say that that's okay for now. And then the other thing, the remaining five, uh, I stuck in the Caribbean sea zone because that sea zone touches Venezuela. Um, it's actually quite a big sea zone there. You see it covers sort of that whole area. Um, Venezuela is there, and so that convoy there sitting there actually picks up the half resource from Venezuela. So there's six oil resources in Venezuela. Um, if you cut that in half, you know, half goes to the Commonwealth, half is going to go to America. Um, that's three. The five convoys covers the three. So we could set that up, and again, assuming my North Atlantic to Cape St. Vincent connection is true, and I think it is, um, we have the U.S. convoy set up as needed, and we're, we're essentially done with the U.S. See, it was, it was pretty easy, right? But we didn't have very many strategic choices to make as the U.S. Very straightforward stuff. Um, so we're, we're done with the U.S., and now we can start looking at the USSR, which is going to be a little bit more complicated just because there's more stuff to be thinking about. So I'm going to put a cut here, and we'll take a look at that next. Okay, so back and looking to do the setup for the Soviet Union, the USSR. Now, the thing that is really important to consider uh, with the World in Flames is that setup is strategy. So there's a lot of ways that you, know, you could do a setup and it's not super efficient or effective and you can still kind of manage, but if you really want to push uh, and, and do things well, um, you try to you really need to try to think ahead as much as possible. Now, when we look at the USSR's um, setup, this is going to be true for other powers as well, not as much for the US, which is why we did them already. But with the USR, USSR, you really have to be thinking about where am I going to set up these units and, and what are my goals? What, are, what am I trying to do uh, in the early phases of the game? What, what can I even do at all? Um, and I have the map here up just to kind of talk for a second because uh, the Soviet Union has things to do in the early phases of the game before 1941. Um, some of it is observing the game as it starts to play out, how well the Axis is doing against the Western Allies and how do you want to prep and, and what things are you pushing on to influence the game. But, um, and this goes for the Axis more so than even Russia, but it is very good to have an idea of what you're going to accomplish in those first so many turns, and your setup should reflect that. Now, what I've done to help myself, um, and I'll figure out a way to get this posted for folks. I mean, it's very, it's a very simple thing. Uh, anyone could do it, just going and looking at history and the timeline. Is I try to figure out, like, what's, what's the checklist? If you were to make a checklist of ac actions that you should be trying to do, by a given time frame. Now what I have listed here for each of the powers, and I'm playing them all myself, so this checklist is good either way, is to make note of the different countries, um, the, the objectives that need to be accomplished, and the time frame in which those events occurred historically, uh, and, and that way I can check it off a list, or I can evaluate how I'm doing against the history, because ultimately, uh, if, especially if you're the offensive player like the Axis is in the early game, you're really figuring out what you're doing uh, in terms of efficiency. Like, e how well you're doing is based on that. Like, you're gonna, you're eventually gonna knock France out of the war. You're gonna get beachy France. It really matters when it happens more than it is a question of if it's going to happen. And as the Axis, you have a, a pretty tight schedule to keep, and everything that you do, from moving units around to do setup, is gonna impact that timetable. You want to do things as efficiently as possible as quickly as possible. Um, and so when we get to the German setup, that's going to matter a whole lot more. But Russia is a good starting point to look at why are you going to set up the units where you're going to end up placing them. So if I look at the USSR part of this chart, I separated them from the Western Allies because they have so much of their own stuff to do. 
Historically, they partici participated in the partition of Poland. Then they invaded Finland. Uh, we had the Winter War, which um, has certain mechanics in the way it plays out in the game, uh, which I can talk to a little bit later. But basically, you know, Finland can give up, you know, Germany can choose for the Finns to give up a certain amount of territory to avoid a war where the Finns could could potentially be conquered outright. Um, we've got the invasion of the Baltic states in June 40, which uh, happened historically in June 40, I guess. Um, so we've got that to look at. Uh, we're going to invade or pressure Romania for the Bessarabia territory. Um, and this doesn't really matter because Persia, Iran, is not in the game. Um, I guess I should label this Iran, I'm not sure. Uh, they're out of this scenario, so I just put this here for historical reference. Whoops. But they would help participate in an invasion of Persia to open up lines to the west, but we won't worry about that. <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union has to survive from 41 to 44. That's really their primary goal for the majority of the game. And then as they start heading west, we should have liberated the Balkans in the uh, late summer and fall of 44 before getting into Germany in 45. So if we look at this timetable, we want to have uh, the ability to participate in the partition of Poland, and we want to be able to potentially invade Finland in the early game. If we can conquer Finland early as the USSR, that could be valuable um, and a nice thing to have in our pocket. Uh, otherwise, just getting the extra hexes of the territory that we could potentially capture and keep after the war is also kind of worthwhile looking at, as well as the Baltic states. So if you were to look at it, at least in the like early 39 portion of the game, and head, starting to head into 40, um, we want to kind of be positioned uh, in this region of the map. Less so down here, we want to be set up over here. Now, you know, in some crazy circumstances, Germany might be trying for a 1940 invasion of Russia, but that's not going to happen in this game. I'm just going to tell you right now. So we're going to be thinking about our Russian setup in terms of those early strategic level goals of potentially taking out Finland, conquering uh, Eastern the, the Eastern European countries that they're going to fall really easily, and I'll show you how e just how easy that is um, when we get there, and, and I'll explain the setup here. So um, I've got this for, for again, uh, the three kind of sections of the teams, Western allies being separate, and they have a similar thing of what they're doing in reaction. It's really the German checklist that really matters in terms of what all are you doing and the timeline that you're doing it on. So just to start here, guys, and um, I'm going to take us back over to the force pools and start talking about the Russian unit pools here in just a second. Okay, so we're going to start looking at the Russian setup. And again, you know, there's a bit of disjointedness of me walking back and forth uh, between the stacks of counters and um, the map. And I, and I don't want to keep recording myself going back and forth and back and forth. So I just want to speak to um, what you're going to see here on the chart compared to your force pool over to the side here and, and talk about the things that we can set up very easily. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we can see this stuff that we really care about. So um, there's going to be in some Black Sea ports and some Baltic Sea ports very particular naval units. Now these guys um, are named ships and if we look over it is the Marat and the Kirov as well as the Paris Commune and the Trivona Ukraina um, so these ships, sorry, camera's screwing up. I don't know why it does it. I need a new camera. Um, these ships are going to go in Baltic Sea ports and Black Sea ports. So two ships each, and they're going to go into any ports that are on the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea. Um, or rather, you know, there are two that have to go in the Baltic. There are two that have to go in the Black Sea. They can go in any ports on that sea that are controlled by the USSR. So for the Baltic, we're probably going to chuck them into Leningrad. Uh, for the Black Sea, we might just pick Sevastopol and be done with it. Very easy, straightforward stuff. You then see a line here that says Europe. Now, uh, Europe is basically the Europe map, so anywhere that the USSR controls uh, territory in Europe. Uh, we can put the HQ named Timoshenko, so you would look in your HQ force pool, and you would find Timoshenko. While you're there, you'd also pull out Zhukov, because he's going to be on the Jan Feb. Uh, production circle slice as a reinforcement. 
we're then going to start to pull units out. And again, if you look at you know the the column names, we're going to get uh, a mech. We're going to get some infantry. We're going to get some cavalry. Um, and we're going to get some garrisons. We're going to get a few planes. And then if you look here under the naval section, we're going to get a transport, a sub, and 10 convoy points. And again, because this is Europe, they don't all have to go into the same hex or anything. They can just be anywhere in Europe where you think it makes sense to put them. We're going to end up with one ship in the construction pool. And then uh, there's also a sub on the reinforcements and another ship in the reinforcements. So again, not a whole lot here. And, and to set these up, just like we did for the, the U.S., we're going to go to each force pool over here, and we're going to pull them out of the force pool, drawing randomly where there are multiple units. So I'm not going to do that on camera. I think you guys have seen enough examples of that through the U.S. Um, that I'm going to take care of that, and I'm going to get all these units on the map, and I'm going to show you where I've selected to put those for Russia. Okay, so let's take a look at what I did here. Uh, we got the Black Sea fleet there and then additionally and I'm having to rotate the camera a little bit here and I'm setting the camera up to sit right above it potentially if I can okay let's try that okay so what have I done here so I went off the sheet and I pulled off a, the Timoshenko HQ a mech unit, two infantry, two garrison, uh, a cav, two fighters, and a three-build bomber and a four-build bomber. I also pulled off transport and subs as well as convoys. Now, the, uh, the Baltic fleet is in Leningrad there. What else do we have? Um, I'm sort of setting them aside just for stacking purpose. So we have a sub. Pull that randomly. I pulled the transport. Uh, technically, I guess I could put them in uranium, uranium bomb, but we'll say that they're in Leningrad along with the rest of the units here. I put the uh, convoys up here in Murmansk. Uh, now, there is some goofiness there uh, out there that, you know, there's a way to put a convoy in the Caspian for supply purposes during Barbarossa and a bunch of things. Uh, because we're working with limited convoys, I opted to put them up here so that they can be the help become a Murmansk convoy uh, group. So they're operating out of Archangel right now, or they're ported there. And when the time eventually comes for uh, Lendleys, they will be able to uh, get out of port into the sea. They'll probably have to deal with some Germans at that point, but uh, having the Murmansk convoy is going to be valuable to some degree, obviously, so important that I have that here. I put a garrison unit up here in Murmansk. It's a one movement, not a big deal. But the reason why he's up there is to threaten this Finnish resource here in Petsamo. Um, now, uh, if you look really carefully, uh, if you were to look at your map, you'd notice there's a slight break right here of gray. Technically, these one, two, three, four, five hexes are considered off-map hexes, or, or off-map box hexes. Um, they are on a different scale. I believe they're on, they're either the same scale as the America map, or maybe it's the Pacific map. I can't remember off the top of my head. The main thing is, moving just one hex is very likely going to flip a unit that moves. Because basically, you're always allowed to move one hex, uh, but if it is, if the cost to enter that one hex that you're moving is greater than your movement allowance, you flip. And so this garrison would flip, but I'm kind of okay with that because ultimately I just want them to cross the border and seize the resource, which um, we could then, again, set out a convoy out to sea and then start pulling this resource via the naval connection into this port and then on the rail lines. Now, the, the, the USSR has more resources and, and whatnot than we really need to worry about, but... Um, it is something we'd want to take to, just to, pro, uh, you know, basically, if we, if we were to take it, keep it from the axis eventually. So that's kind of the key thing there. Um, in Leningrad itself, I have the, uh, like I said, the Baltic Fleet. I also have a six-strength garrison unit. I have two fighters and a mechanized unit. 
The mechanized unit's there to add some offensive capability and the ability to blitz on an attack. So they're situated there. The fighters are there to provide cover for the bombers, which are over here. Now on this stack we have the Timoshenko HQ. We have another infantry corps as sort of backup. Same thing with this infantry corps. I also put them here as backup. Uh, and these two bombers, which are basically all within range to bomb Finland. So, and, and this is like the majority, or pretty much all of, the Russian forces that are going to be on the map, sans the, the Black Sea Fleet. So why do I have it set up this way? Oh, of course, can't forget our, uh, our cavalry down here. Uh, two, four, you know, four movement, two combat strength cavalry. So why do I have those guys there? So what's going to happen in the early phase of the game is that uh, we're going to have the Axis uh, invade Poland, and that whole thing will start off. Uh, basically, when they do that, you can have the partition of Poland happen kind of automatically by having the uh, Soviets move one unit into any hex of eastern Poland. And right up here is part of eastern Poland. That, so entering that hex by itself will allow us to seize eastern Poland. It's just sort of an abstraction of the the smaller amount of Russian forces that took the partition. They're just sort of making it easier for us. So all we're going to end up doing is we're going to take this guy, we're going to move him in here. He, he will take eastern Poland and then very shortly thereafter you have the Baltic states. So we have um, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Well there are special rules there as well. There are some, even some weird rules that if the Germans try to have a very early war against the Soviets, these guys can kind of matter a little bit more. But essentially what's going to happen is after the Soviets have seized eastern Poland, they're basically going to be able to come into here, enter just this one hex, and uh, they will have conquered the, uh, the Baltic states. And so we'll gain control of this area as well. And we only need one unit to do it, so the most economical you know, efficient way of moving is bop, bop, or you could even go, because this might be better for positioning, move here, and then one, two, three, you know, the fourth move gets you into the capital of uh, Lithuania, and then that is all you really need to worry about. Um, there we go. You guys probably didn't see some of that. Uh, hmm. Yeah, you probably didn't see any of that. <laughs> God, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. Basically, you're going to move to here, and then here, or, you know, here, and then here. Either way, you're going to see the Baltic states in eastern Poland fall to the Soviets. Pretty straightforward stuff. Nothing too much to get crazy worried about. It's almost like a gimme, but you, you still got to do it. You got to move the force to represent it. Really sorry that you guys didn't see some of that on the camera. My, my bad. I feel bad for that, but I've been reporting too long. Um, anyway, so the rest of these forces, I have a very threatening posture up here in Finland. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. The way Finland works in this game is that basically the, the Soviets can claim the Finnish borderlands, which are these hexes here. You say, why, why is that important? Well, any hexes that are in front of Leningrad help make it unlikely that Leningrad itself will be attacked later in the war by Germans or Finns from the north. Um, and by making that claim, the German player acting for Finland has to decide, do they allow the claim and hand those hexes over, or do they fight it out? Now, maybe if the Soviets had less forces up here, that would dare the Finns to fight back full force, and then the Soviets are at war with the Finns. And it could end up being that the Soviets somehow managed to completely conquer Finland, though that would be hard to do, and would be generally bad for uh, the Germans. There's also some mechanics where the Germans can enforce a peace, basically. That's maybe what you could consider a historical ending to that, where the, the Soviets invade, the Winter War doesn't go so great, but it's in such a position where um, they kind of peace out, they can peace out and uh, you know, the Russians will have taken some territory, maybe like Patsamo, and they can keep that. So the whole reason I'm uh, this strategy that I'm putting in effect with my setup is I'm signaling to all other players, hey, the Soviets are lined up, we're ready to fight for Finland, 
and we're going to make the claim. And now the, the German part of me, uh, when I respond eventually, will be, do I let it happen or do I chance it? And it looks like the Russians have come in force. If they end up allowing the Russians to keep the claim, um, then, you know, I, I get the hexes. Cool, I'll, I'll probably pop a unit in there or whatever. And then I'll start to move the rest of that uh, force, the Soviet force, down south and start looking at Bessarabia and Romania for a similar mechanic there. So this is just an opening thing, again, looking at my checklist of historical events. The invasion or pressuring of Finland is pretty early in the game. We'll seek to do that. We'll capture the Baltic states. We'll capture eastern Poland. And that should be pretty straightforward in terms of a Russian startup. So with that, Russian setup is complete. And we can now move on to Italy. Okay, so I figured I wouldn't look at, like, the spreadsheet set up line by line again now. I think you, if you've been watching so far, I think you're getting it, right? You read the section, you pull randomly from the setup counters that you have for what the chart calls for, and then you set up accordingly. Um, so I, I just did the Italian setup, and I just set it up um, to, to the charts, and there's a little bit of... Um, leeway that the Italians get. So first thing I'll just call out that the Italians get 15 convoys and again I, I'm skipping a step here. I'm doing a little bit ahead but just to make sure I'm getting it right. I'm getting the convoys set out so we've got this is continuing from the American convoys now picked up you know the rest of the pipeline in the Italian American trade is now Italian convoys here and here to get to Italy. What's nice is that these convoys here get to pick up this extra resource from Sardinia and bring it into Italy, which is convenient. We need, we can't just get that resource from Sardinia into Italy for free. We need to get ship at home. And fortunately, there's just, you know, this pipeline of five convoys is only using four of the five. So the fifth one can, can take this resource into Italy itself. Now, the funny thing about Italy is, they, they do get some stuff over here, and the, the, they get a repair pool unit. They get uh, some units that are going to come in as reinforcements, some ships that are not going to be finished building. Um, let's see, there's a fighter, or I'm sorry, a land bomber and a motorized infantry. There's a ship that's going to finish, and then a ship that will go into the construction pool when we get to May, June. But what's interesting with Italy is that you have some leeway. One of the lines just says Europe. Um, now... Uh, <laughs> the units in that line are an HQ and all of the Air Force of the Italians, which means that you can put that second HQ kind of wherever you want. You can put the Air Forces wherever you want in Europe. But there are some units that have to be in Libya, and there are some forces that have to be in Italy. And so what I have chosen to do, and eh, we'll, we'll call it an okay move. I, I don't know how good it really is at the end of the day, but I want to make sure I'm I'm at least somewhat threatening is Italy. Italy doesn't start with much, and they don't tend to get much, is I put one of the required garrisons in Libya. I put it in the capital just so that it can't just be easily scooped up. Um, I then put a fighter over here with an HQ, the Baldo HQ, and an infantry in Bardia around here just to, to say, like, hey, if we enter the war with the Commonwealth, they can't leave Egypt empty. We do got, do have guys down here. We'll probably reinforce them in time, but for now, we're at least putting guys there. It's not just freebies to take over there. Um, as we look into Italy, we have the uh, Italian fleet over here, along with um, kind of, yeah, I don't know. I have uh, the majority of the fleet here in this big big stack. I also have uh, some transports, as well as uh, the leftover extra convoy denomination that I don't have a use for, but could be used to replace losses, so it's going to stay in port. There are transports, which we'll be using to ferry more units down to Libya. I might rearrange where they're at, um, just because, you know, wherever they show up... That's okay, I guess they could come in into Naples. So the fleet's at Naples, the transports are at Naples. Basically, the idea will be if we build more units, we can put them on the transports, send them to Egypt, if that's what we want to do. Um, uh, I have a naval bomber plane just here on the coast, so it will 
look to project Italian air power into the Mediterranean, which will be useful. We also have uh, the subs that I pulled. I pulled, pulled the good subs, and they're just in port here in... Civ oh, God. Civitiva Vecchia in this port, and we'll look to use them for uh, sub rating when the time comes. And then the vast majority of the Italian forces are sort of lined up against um, France here, and I have an, the primary HQ that's supposed to be in Italy there, next to Milan. I have a fighter and a bomber in the hex. The uh, aircraft stacking is usually one but with an, in a clear hex, but with an HQ that goes up to two, so both of those plane units are there. We have a mechanized unit and a regular infantry here along the coast. We've got a mountaineer in this mountain, sort of protecting this resource, and a motorized here uh, in Turin so that it can threaten up here. The whole reason I'm setting these guys up is that, hey, if we go to war as the, as the Axis goes to war with France and the Italians decide to join in, they're kind of well positioned to go through the south. Now, the mountains would make that a tremendous difficulty, but by threatening there, it's going to force the French player to think about leaving some guys down there. Um, it's just something that they may have to consider. Uh, they might just give up on the idea entirely, but um, the Italians don't have a whole lot else to do, and most of these units uh, had to set up in Italy anyway, so they couldn't simply be sent uh, out to... Uh, Libya very easily. At some point, you know, after the war gets started, and whatever shenanigans happen over here, we'll eventually start pointing the Italians towards Yugoslavia, probably, or uh, Greece. So, you know, the nice thing about Italy being in the center of the map, essentially, is that they kind of have the ability to rearrange their forces relatively easily, and we've got some time. Um, the, the Italians joined the war in 40, um, so we've got some time to play with. If we want to correct any mistakes that we feel we've made in our setup, we've got time to move units around or ship them around. Not playing with oil, I kind of can send stuff wherever I want without worrying too much about oil expenditure. So there is that. So, okay. Uh, well, the Italians are done then. Um, if there's an, an ends up being any commentary on that, let me know. But I think that's just a, a general start um, for the Italians. Next is going to come the Commonwealth, which is a very complex power to set up. And that's going to take some uh, explanation. So uh, we'll put a cut here, and when we come back, I'll hopefully have set up all the UK Commonwealth stuff, and we can talk about what all of that really means for gameplay. Okay, uh, we're back with the Commonwealth setup being complete. And let me tell you, this one is a little bit of a challenge. And um, some of the reason why, if you're new to WIF, um, the... The production system, as I mentioned before, you know, you need to get a resource to a factory. The UK, the principal, you know, country of the Commonwealth faction, is flush with factories, as one might expect, but not as much so with resources. And I had to take special attention of the uh, scenario rules where it talks about off-map production, the transfer pool and the production information here. And what you need to keep in mind um, is that just because it says you have these things in the add start production doesn't mean you have them and that you are certain to get them when it comes to production. For land-based powers, you usually will, but for the Commonwealth, who's spread all across the world, this is much more difficult. So let's take a quick look at the setup chart. So. Um, right away, you'll notice that the Commonwealth has a lot of things that are naval-oriented all around the world. Uh, so we have things that are coming in as reinforcements. They are on the chart. We have some things that start in the transfer pool. Now, the transfer pool is a mechanic to represent the uh, Pacific theater um, and like Indian Ocean and east part of Africa. And what I did to represent that is I took a snapshot of the vassal module of the Mozambique uh, channel um, sea zone area and that is supposed to represent uh, the transfer pool. I think maybe the, the scenario expected you to set up um, the Pacific map where the Mozambique channel sea box is. Um, but 
I didn't want to do that because I'm out of table space, so I just printed that off, and I set it over Saudi Arabia, who is basically out of the game. Um, Iraq could come in to the game, but uh, we won't worry about that for now. So I just set it over there, and so there are some naval units that start there as well. That's all very straightforward stuff. Um, and then uh, what we had were a floating infantry that could go anywhere in Europe. I chose to put it in Egypt because we have our uh, Wavel, Wavel, I don't know how to say it, I'm sorry, uh, HQ in Egypt. And so sort of in response to the fair assortment of Italians, we have down here in Egypt a, a pretty decently strong infantry corps and a HQ. Um, similarly then, we have in the UK the Gort HQ and some, uh, some other units. We get a, a mech unit and two motorized units. And we get a bunch of air that all has to start uh, in the UK. Now, here's the thing. Um, in this setup, uh, we do not get to set up stuff in Gibraltar or Malta by default, which means those, place, those places are empty and at risk uh, in the early phase of the game. And what I need to do as the Commonwealth is eventually get some guys, some spare guys down there um, and once we've mobilized and called out reserves, that's going to be a little bit easier to do. Um, the air I have up here, the fighters are situated here. We have uh, some land bombers in London along with fighters. Um, actually, I think what I want to do is I'm going to move one fighter over to Plymouth on top of that naval stack just, just to make sure they don't get caught surprised. Um, also in Plymouth, we have a, a, a sub... Uh, and we have some leftover convoys hidden behind that stack there, and I'll speak to that in a second. Um, over here we have an air transport, which is with a unit, uh, and we have two transport ships, uh, transport sh naval units, with the Gore HQ and the mechanized unit. So we're basically set up to you know, send the majority of our ground forces into France as the British Expeditionary Force, um, and a strong force at that to help defend France. Um, maybe the only thing to watch out for is that because we're not playing with divisions, <laughs> you know, that, that truly is the, the bulk of the British, uh, ground forces until we call out the reserves, but, um, that ends up being very easy and, and not a whole lot to worry about, I guess. So, not to worry. The main thing about that setup for the ground setup for the Commonwealth is that we have things just set up to go, uh, to get the guys situated into France early and then get the transports back and, and get them ready to transport more units um, around the Mediterranean once we have that opportunity. So those transports are going to be very busy ships uh, moving guys around and that's really important overall for the Commonwealth to have good sense of where your uh, transports need to be and where your naval units are in general. There's another transport unit uh, down here in the, uh, the transfer pool. So when we get units eventually that will, that will start off map, these being uh, Indian or Australian units that we build, they'll appear you know, over here and we'll use that transport uh, ship to bring them to, to Egypt or you know, wherever, uh, depending on the, the case that we have there. There are uh, naval units that start out here. These are essentially the units that are marked as Pacific. Um, they start out there basically in a port in the Mozambique Channel representing the broader Pacific. They'll be put to sea to basically help defend uh, the, the convoys that are coming out of there. We might also uh, maybe choose to pull them back into Egypt and the Red Sea and Eastern Med if we really feel we need to. The main, main British fleet is in Scapa Flow in Plymouth. Um, we also got a couple of guys down here in Africa, but they're not doing a whole lot of work, and I'll tell you why here shortly. Um, so the main fleet is in Scapa Flow. I also split off a decently strong force over here. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of operational flexibility, so the main fleet in Scapa Flow would look to patrol the North Sea or the go to the Pharaoh's Gap if they have to, while uh, the ships in Plymouth are oriented a little bit uh, easier to go down into the Bay of Biscay or Cape St. Vincent uh, over here if need be. And some of that is just to help deal with the eventual sub uh, interaction that will have to happen. So 
The main fleet has a couple of our sorting aircraft carriers. Our secondary fleet has an aircraft carrier and a decent assortment of other ships. Uh, most of the battleships are in the Scapa Flow uh, fleet, expecting to fight the Kriegsmarine in the North Sea, um, and everything else is in decent shape there. Um, so, all good. All good to start. Now, the final thing that really matters for the Commonwealth, the thing that's very tricky about the Commonwealth, is that the Commonwealth has these convoys set up, right? I so said that, that's the tricky part, and I sort of <laughs> went on a tangent. Um, here's the thing. To get the most production, at, at most, uh, when I look around online at um, convoy setups, m almost all the ones that are out there are using expansion counters like Convoy and Flames, where you can use denominations of whatever convoys you want. Here, we are ooh, operating a little more tightly, um, and I guess in some ways it makes it easier to keep track of what... what uh, what convoy lines are good and which ones are bad and what what the word is so here's the thing basically we had a certain allotment of convoy points that start in certain areas and like i s said before i'm setting up the convoys ahead of time just to get it out of the way the commonwealth would get 50 starting in uh, the british isles or the uk they would get 10 in america so canada and then they would get 30 starting in the transfer pool and Essentially, what you would need to do then is move these convoys from the port, from the port areas they would start in to create the the pipeline uh, of resources. And that constraint of you know a lot of them are going to start in the UK is that you you can only move them from the UK essentially with your naval move. And so you really have to think through this. This took me several minutes to figure out how to do this because. If I was playing Deluxe, I would have the de extra denominations of convoys. I would have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, counters that I could use to get really, like, discreet and, and specific and exact on where I'm pulling resources from and shipping them. Here, I basically had to find the most economical use of my five and ten-sided counters um, just to figure out what how to get everything where I think they need to be. So, I'm going to show you my convoy setup. Um, I can't tell you that this is the most ideal, but I think it works. And when I compare it to other uh, setups for World in Flames, it's about as good as one can hope, uh, given the circumstances here. So, let me start with the, the, the Americas map and talk about what I have done. Okay, so first things first, there were 10 convoys that started in Canada. And because each convoy's range is three, I could basically move them one, two, three C zones uh, for placement. So if I had them start in Halifax up here, um, I could send them three away, right? What I did is I sent them, I sent the ten split into two counters of five down to the Caribbean and down uh, over here to the mouth of the Amazon. The mouth of the Amazon um, appears to connect with the Caribbean, the pivot point being uh, the Martinique Island, but uh, Island of Martinique, but I believe that we can ship this way. And now, here, here's the thinking. First, we're going to be getting the two resources from British Guyana. So out of the five available convoys, we're using two for those resources. When the Netherlands is uh, attacked by the Germans, which will inevitably happen, they will align with the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth will be able to use uh, the resource there for production purposes. And so, not right away, but eventually that will become uh, three if, if we need it to, um, if for some reason we, we have to do it that way. I don't think we're going to need to, but um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so, so from there, we have the two... When we go to the Caribbean, we're going to ship it through the Caribbean, we're going to pick up three more resources from Venezuela. So uh, the Americans get half of the Venezuelan resources, which is six, so they get three. The Commonwealth gets the other three. Three plus two is five, so we're now maxed out here at five. Um, then we had some more convoy, uh, convoy points. Now there's ten in the East Coast, and there's 10 in the North Atlantic. Those 20 
convoy points total um, came from the UK. So they came from, you know, I would have placed them in, um, let's see, what is it, Glasgow, and they would have moved one, two, three, being the farthest, which is the East Coast, to arrive there. Now the 10 in the, in the East Coast is continuing to pick up the resources from the Caribbean, so five, and then what it's also doing is picking up the excess resources in Canada. So Canada has uh, two factories. They have six resources altogether. Um, let me just double check that. Yeah, six altogether. So there's four extra in Canada, four extra resources that aren't getting to a factory. So those four are picked up here with the ten convoys there. So there's four coming from Canada, five through the Caribbean, so nine. Nine resources, and we have to use a ten to hold all of that. That's our only option. So then the ten continues on to the North Atlantic Sea Zone, and then finally, the final leg of the journey is ten convoy points in the Pharaoh's Gap. Now I put a little note there that says nine, uh, because we're not getting 10 resources shipped to the UK. We're only getting 9, so we have a little bit of waste. There's there's effectively one convoy of waste there. But again, without the extra denominations, that's our only uh, real opportunity. Now, the other set of resources coming to the UK is a bit more complicated due to the special rules. So, basically, um, and I had to do this just to simplify. I should also point out that I basically left myself with 10 extra convoys um, but you'll uh, in the UK, but we'll, we'll count it up at the end here just to show. So in the uh, transport area here, um, the rules point to uh, basically um, you, we get an extra resource off the eastern map edge um, where one extra resource point for each two French or, and or Commonwealth convoy points in the zero box of the transfer pool during the production step to a maximum of three oil and four other resources. They still need to be transported to a factory to be used. Uh, we could instead transport it, um, so that's, that's assuming we're going through, uh, I, th I think that's assuming we're going through the Red Sea. The Commonwealth may instead transport them through the Cape Basin Sea area to the United Kingdom, but in that case only gets one resource point for every three convoy convoys in the transfer pool. So I believe I believe by um, Because of the limited amount of convoys I have, we started with 30 down here. What I tried to figure out was, okay, well then, I, if I do two, um, per if I get two convoys as a resource point, I decided to do 10 here. So 10 uh, convoy points in the, the Mozambique channel itself, the transfer pool. So we got five resources, but then we need to get five resources back home which I took through uh, the Red Sea, the Eastern Med, and then the Western Med, and if I recall correctly, um, all the ones that are up to the Western Mediterranean had been sourced from uh, the, uh, the transfer pool. So we had 30, we used 10 to stay there, then we used 15, getting them uh, over to here, and then I have five in reserve left over in the transfer pool in case something gets destroyed. And then th this counter and this counter originated in the UK and moved out here to pick up the rest. So five to five to five back to home. And so out of the 50 that started in the UK, uh, we have used 40 total. 30, creating this northern link, 10, finishing this link, with 10 left over at port. We use the 10 American ones to help create this 
South America to the Caribbean through the northern link. And then uh, for the 30 in the transfer pool, again, 10 in the transfer pool, and then we spent 15 getting them to this C zone, you know, effectively through the Western Med with five left over. Now, that means 15 convoy points are unused, but here's the thing. You kind of want to have a little bit of a cushion. If a sub, you know, German sub goes out there and knocks out one of these convoy points, we want to be able to get a replacement out there, um, and we have the ability to do that right now. This effectively means that we're getting 9 plus 5 is 14 resources back uh, to the UK, and that's about as good or slightly like one-off most other setups that I've seen online, at least for the initial start of the game. Um, I think I, I see a lot of posts that have them with like 15, uh, 15 resources getting back to the UK, so I'm off by one, and again, that is mostly because I can't quite finagle... Uh, the denominations any more efficiently. What this does do is it puts a lot of importance on the Mediterranean and whether or not the Mediterranean ever gets closed by the Axis. As is right now, if the Axis were capable of closing the Med, it would be a major problem for the Commonwealth, as it should be. So something to keep in mind, you know, if you're playing with the Deluxe game, the, the, the Commonwealth has a little bit more flexibility. They can adapt to damages on the supply lines a little bit easier here in the Classic game. Um, I basically resigned myself to saying I want the most production possible, but to do so I'm sending it through the med, which can be dangerous. I think that's a decent uh, simulation of the risk decision here. Um, I could be spending uh, convoys less efficiently and have it go around Africa, but then the Commonwealth will have fewer production. We can always look to build more convoys, and in fact I've got a southern uh, convoy line that I'd like to get set up to get some resources out of Africa. Um, the sort of central west part of Africa, I can get a few points out and bring it up along this way, but I don't have any convoy, I don't have enough convoys basically to complete the chain, even with the excess ones uh, that I have here, and, and that's that's the real challenge I find myself in. So um, there we go. The, the Commonwealth is set up, our navies are set up, um, are positioned to be able to head out to sea, uh, when the time comes, the convoys are appropriate, the ground forces are there, the air power is there, and so now <laughs> we can start looking at doing the setup for France, which uh, we'll start looking at here in just a couple minutes. Well, for me, a couple of minutes, for you, just a sec. Okay, and so here's the French setup. Now, the French setup <laughs> is pretty straightforward. There's not much to it, uh, as you can imagine now. It looks awfully thin, doesn't it? But uh, that is because we still haven't called out the reserves, which we'll get. Um, Belgium and the Netherlands are still kind of in the way, so we have some time to get guys moved over uh, to get the BEF onto the continent when the time comes. So I just have a couple of units down here in the south, just kind of blocking some of the, the mountain passes so that the Italians can't do an early declaration of war and just sort of stomp in in the early phases of the game. Um, and I've got the Maginot line covered uh, and we've got some HQs and some air units sort of up there uh, near the low countries. Again, we'll, we'll be filling that zone in with units here um, before long. It's just going to take a little bit. Um, for the Navy, I stuck the majority of the French Navy down there in Toulon, and I, I'm not sure, I, I maybe could have put the aircraft carrier um, somewhere else that might have been more valuable, but I'm not really sure. The, the French Navy, for me, I've just never figured out what, what's the best way to use them, so for now we'll stick them there, and if we need to do something else with them, we'll figure it out later. There are transports, which I have here in uh, Marseille. As I'm looking at the setup charts, I actually think I might modify it if I can. Um, let's see, note one, transport, and that note one is on Europe, so that, that's technically the whole Europe map. So what I think I might actually do, just, just to save ourselves an extra movement, I'm going to have the transport here in Algiers with the Moroccan uh, unit. So once the war breaks out, we will swiftly 
transport that uh, that unit up to the mainland uh, to support the defense of France. Now the convoys, the French only got 15 convoys, and so what I decided to do was stick one down over here to pull the Senegalese resource that's going to take it to here, and then uh, there's also a resource in Algeria which we can rail, and basically because Spain is neutral right now, um, uh, I believe we can use it as a minor rail path. Uh, so these resources are kind of being shipped into Gibraltar um, and then uh, piped, or, or even Cadiz, really, um, over here. So I've got the convoy here, picking it up around the corner of Africa, and then we're railing it through Spain to get to France. Now, if Spain joins the Axis via Gibraltar falling, you know, this might be not the best way to do it, but um, I think that's all legal. And I have my con my extra convoy there in Bordeaux, just in case we need to replace it. I, I can't get um, set up to go anywhere else to grab the uh, Iraq uh, oil that is supposed to be promised to France. I just don't really have the uh, the convoys to get there. And in this game, without oil rules, an oil's just a resource. So I'd rather get the two over in the west rather than the one out in the east that is in greater danger of being cut off from the Italians anyway the way I have it set up here I mostly avoid uh, in, in Italian entanglements for now um, and we'll look at that if it turns out I actually have to get a convoy out to the Bay of Biscay to get these resources up um, that's an easy thing to do I just I think I can rail it through Spain so there's no need to do that um, I can double check later so um, everything else, just in terms of the unit setup, so, uh, you know, we've got some units that are going on the production spiral. The French armor will come in in March, April. Um, we're going to get a plane unit in Jan, Feb, and then there are some ships in the various pools, construction and otherwise. Uh, the French don't start with anything in the transfer pool. If the British had excess convoys they wanted to use to get resources to France, they could do that, but I don't see much of a reason to. We really need all those convoys for the UK as it is. So I think we're good there. Um, I might have to adjust the French setup just a little bit as I'm looking at it, but I think we're good here. You can see, I mean, it's it's pretty basic stuff, right? We're defending on the Maginot Line. We're sort of trying to cover the Ardennes, and then we're going to put more units on the board. Um, once we call out our reserves and we build some more stuff, it's going to, you know, the Germans aren't going to be knocking through France early, or will they? I guess is the interesting question. Um, so, uh, on that point, um, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have this video stop. So this is, a, is probably getting into a pretty long video. We've done setup for most of the factions. The only one left is Germany. And Germany has a fair bit to set up, and Germany's setup is probably more important than any others because right from the get-go, they're in action. I mean, as the Italians, you can kind of move stuff around. You're not at war the French can move stuff around. They're not at war. Well, they're at war, but they're not in heavy danger yet. Um, same with the Commonwealth. Russians have some leeway. But for the Germans, you really have to be, you know, you're, you're starting the war, right? You're getting things going, and you have to do things just so uh, to be effective. So I'm going to dedicate probably a whole video to that and to talk about ultimate grand strategy when it comes to WIF as the Axis, because ultimately they need to set the tempo of the game and where and what they're going to do. So, uh, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, thanks for sticking with the long video. I hope this uh, setup video has been useful to new players who are trying to understand how and where to set things up. Obviously, if you're playing with expansions or optional rules, the setup that I did might vary. If I were playing with oil, then I'd be thinking more about how to get the oil resources back home more than just the normal resources. If I were playing with convoys and flames, the convoys would be a little bit easier. If I were playing with divisions, I'd be setting up divisions. If I were playing with offensive points, I'd be adding offensive points uh, to the marker track for that, for each power. But we're playing just the most basic version of the game, uh, which is still uh, a lot, obviously, to, to tackle if you're a new player. So um, let me know in the comments section down below what you think of this video, if there's things I could help with or to be more specific with. 
Um, and if you're an expert at WIF and you're watching this and you want to point out some certain considerations I haven't taken into account, let me know. I consider myself more of like an intermediate, just barely beyond beginner because I've only been playing with WIF for so long. Some people have been playing it for decades. I really like it. I spend a lot of time reading the rules and just figuring things out, but I'm certainly no expert uh, and, and I'm not super great at the ultimate strategies that can win the game for anybody. So keep that in mind as you watch this. I'm just helping help, a guiding hand through the world of WIF. Um, all right, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Take care. Keep gaming.